was not a priest at that time. He, he was uh, a dirty old man. I had no idea what sex was. So I had no idea that that's what he was doing to me. I couldn't stop crying and he was asking me, you know, what, who did this to you? And I couldn't say his name. And he said, we want to make sure he's still not sexually abusing little girls. When 10-year-old Carolyn Jewell arrived at Mount St. Joseph's School in 1956, she was used to being the new kid. As an army brat, that's uh, what you call a child in the army, uh, we had short stints, uh, two to three years, which three years was the longest day. I was the new kid on the block constantly, so you really didn't make friends, uh, lasting friends. It looked like things would be the same in her new home of London, Ontario, until she met the priest from the nearby college. The first time I met Father Sylvester was when he was brought into the class, uh, introduced as a visiting priest. You have to love your priest. I mean, you know, he was a nice person. He appeared to be a nice person. You love all your priests. This nice person would return that love with abuse. Sylvester would victimize dozens of girls across the communities of southwestern Ontario over the next four decades. Carolyn would be one of the first known victims of a priest the kids came to call Father Feeler. It felt like you were caught in a whirlpool uh, and you had no control. But after that first visit to her classroom, Carolyn was happy to strike up a friendship with a man who seemed like a big kid himself. We used to play hide and go seek with him. He took us swimming. He used to make milkshakes for us. Father Sylvester found hours to spend with the small students. Oh, yes, we were special. We were the youngest kids in the whole school to begin with, and so we felt, I think we probably flaunted it whenever we saw the, the high school kids. Like, we're the little kids and we're special. He likes us better. Renowned psychologist Peter Jaffe is an expert on abused children and on the case of Charles Sylvester. He authored an in-depth study on the priest's victims. Most abusers in any system, like Father Sylvester in the, in the church, are people who are very charismatic, very outgoing. They know children, they like children, in, in their own uh, perverted sense of, of that word. Irene Duchesne would meet Father Sylvester 15 years later, when Sylvester came to her classroom looking for girls to volunteer at the church. I just remember feeling so ecstatic, like one of the chosen ones. And, you know, I... All the children loved him. There was no reason not to like him. He treated us well, and he was very kind and gentle. And... Sylvester was very selective, but Irene's classmate, Joanne Morrison, made the cut, too. I felt that probably God had something to do with it, that God was happy with me. And so if the priest chose me, that it was, in fact, God choosing me. You wanted to be your best and do your best, and to be picked was an honor, a huge honor. Yeah. I would go over to the church on Friday after school, and we would fold bulletins for the Sunday Mass. And as a reward, he would give us pop and candy and things like that, which was something that wasn't readily available in our home. When the bulletins were all folded, the treats came out. She had to come and sit on his lap. And this created huge turmoil within me. He would present us with the candy or the pop or whatever, but first he would do this. And that meant kiss on the cheek. 
And that wasn't uncomfortable at the time because, you know, I kissed my uncles on the cheek, things like that. And then as time went on, he'd offer us these treats. And then he would do this. This pattern of escalation was one that Carolyn had seen years before. The first time that, uh, that Father Sylvester uh, touched me, we were playing hide-and-go-seek uh, at the grotto. His rule was that if he found you, he would wrestle with you. He put me on the ground, and um, he felt me up. He also uh, went underneath my clothes and uh, didn't tell anybody. For Irene and Joanne, Father Sylvester's lap became more uncomfortable with each passing Sunday. You, you would usually need to lie somehow to get off the lap, at least I did. And then I would have this guilt because, one, I had no idea what sex was. So I had no idea that that's what he was doing to me. All I knew was I didn't like it. And it gave me a very no feeling. The progression was so slow that it, it wasn't all of a, a sudden one day saying, oh, wait, this is wrong. Because what he did yesterday kind of felt a little uncomfortable, but it couldn't be wrong. My initial reaction was that I must have done something wrong. You know, for because that felt bad, um, then I must have done something bad to get him to do that. Sylvester worked hard to make the girls feel guilty for his sins. They, they, they can't necessarily tell, um, you know, when, when you've crossed the line to inappropriate. And in fact, when they have crossed the line, they feel it's been part of a long-standing pattern of behavior. So they may not even recognize it as something that's the other person's fault, but maybe something that they allowed to happen or in fact encouraged. Sylvester's position commanded respect, so much that other adults ignored the evidence right before their eyes. He would grab you publicly and feel you over your shirt, everywhere. It didn't matter where. But Sylvester's worst abuses came when he got a girl alone. We used to go to confession every Friday. What sins does a 10-year-old kid have? So I asked one of the big kids, uh, give me a sin, give me a sin. And I went into the priest and I said, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, I've committed adultery. I had no idea what the word meant or anything else. He came out, grabbed me, locked me down, and said, you stay here until I come and get you. And he's doing it in the chapel. He's doing it in God's house. And uh, he went beyond the, 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 the incident at, at the grotto. He was, he was uh, he was not, uh, He was not a priest at that time. He, he was a, a dirty old man. He was a, a dirty old man. It would only get worse. Not long after, Sylvester found Carolyn in a deserted hallway and told her to come into a nearby room. And I went in like, I thought he wanted to talk to me. He went beyond touching he went beyond he uh, exposed himself he um forced me to do things that that no child should have to do also told me that if i told anybody that i was going to go to hell my parents were going to go to hell my sister was going to go to hell and that I was a bad person anyway, and I, he might be able to stop me from going to hell. When the abuser is someone like Father Sylvester, it's uh, overwhelming in terms of how much power they have. I mean, the church is the center of the community. It's a very powerful institution. So in fact, the priest is really the center of the universe. I never told anyone during the course of my sexual abuse at the hand of Sylvester because I didn't know what he was doing 
was wrong. How could something your priest, who everyone loves, who everyone goes to Sunday Mass for, who is a representative of Jesus Christ and God Almighty himself, be bad? First time I told my story, I was 31 years old. So, 20 years. Who's going to believe you? So I kept my mouth shut. But inside, Carolyn's pain kept building. Even today, returning to her old school is almost unbearable. It's very uncomfortable right now. One of the first incidences was at the grotto, and that's right over in the backwoods there. That's where Father Sylvester uh, first started his uh, molestation on myself and other, other kids in the class. I just don't want to see anybody else get hurt, it, through, particularly through priests. Carolyn left the school in 1958. So did Sylvester. He moved down the highway to Sarnia, where he spent the next four years. Reporter Jane Sims has followed his trail. She says a change in parish didn't mean a change in Sylvester's M.O. It was a very, very small parish, very close-knit. Um, there were girls that the, he started on his, his uh, what became sort of a routine for him of picking out little girls and molesting them. During those years, some brave girls came forward. But just as Carolyn predicted, adults refused to believe the parish priest was a pedophile. Nobody knows the sad history better than Crown Prosecutor Paul Bailey. Let me give you an example. One little girl went to her teacher in Sarnia and said that Father Sylvester was touching her. The teacher locked the little girl in the broom closet all day, every day, for two weeks. The woman is claustrophobic to this day. In Father Sylvester's case, the little girls knew, some of them at least, that don't get too close. And that word went around that schoolyard. And they called him Sylvester the Molester. They called him Father Feel. But as long as adults ignored the truth, Sylvester the molester was free to prey on new girls. The only escape for his past victims was to lock the memories away. I don't remember when I forgot. Does that make sense? I don't remember when I forgot. As a teenager, I had no self-esteem. Uh, and which turned into self-hatred. At first, I ended up taking a, a little cry for help, a little attempt at suicide. Carolyn made several more attempts, which put her inside various hospitals and mental institutions, where one fellow patient captured her in a drawing. I just hated myself. I just hated everything about me, and I had no idea why. After an escape from one hospital, Carolyn made her final and worst attempt to kill herself. She used chemical cleaning supplies. Before I knew it, I swallowed the drain cleaner. As a result, I um, almost had my throat closed, but I survived that. I can remember being really angry at the doctors uh, for bringing me back because I didn't want to be here. But I also made a vow that uh, I'd never, ever try and kill myself again. While Carolyn struggled to escape her past, her abuser was escaping the law. In 1962 in Sarnia, there was a complaint to the Sarnia Police Department about Father Sylvester molesting girls. The diocese said, we'll look after Father Charlie, right? We'll get him out of there. And you know, once he's out of that parish, that solves the problem. It was a recipe for catastrophe. The uh, bishop at that time immediately transferred Sylvester to Montreal out of province. 
and that effectively brought the investigation to a conclusion. Carolyn had also kept Sylvester's crimes hidden away, but a new experimental treatment for her depression threatened to bring them flooding back. The doctors decided to try to give me a sodium amytal treatment known as truth syrup. They verbally took me back um, through stages in my life and then uh, from places that I don't know where they came from, that incident at, uh, at the Mount started coming out. I can remember saying, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want. I jumped off the uh, stretcher and uh, ran out of the, the clinic to the uh, park. Like I just threw myself on the ground and just sobbing and sobbing, crying my guts out. But Carolyn wasn't ready for the truth. I automatically started not remembering. I suppressed everything that, uh, that had come up in the sodium amytal treatment. But one terrible piece of her past was coming back. Sylvester was heading back to town to pick up right where he left off. Five years after the church shuffled him away, pedophile priest Charles Sylvester was back in the diocese where he had abused Carolyn Jewell and other little girls. He had a new job in Chatham as pastor of St. Ursula's Parish. Conveniently located right next door was the school where he picked Irene and Joanne as his special helpers. I know when I was in the rectory, there were always children there. There was always other little girls there. And there was always somebody sitting on his lap. So yeah, it started out with kiss on the cheek, kiss on the lips, and French kissing. He would fondle us over our clothes, under our clothes. There was a time, the last time that I remember going there, when um, he took me to another room, and that was where the worst of abuse occurred. Like Carolyn before her, Irene repressed her memories of Sylvester's abuse for decades. And I don't remember speaking about it in the playground, but I have spoken with others who said, oh yeah, if he was called Father Feeler, but I don't remember hearing any of those conversations. Even her own wedding couldn't bring it back because Father Sylvester was our parish priest when I was a little girl, we decided that it would be special for him to perform my wedding ceremony. And at the time, he was still sexually abusing little girls. So I don't know how he had the audacity to perform my wedding ceremony. Joanne never forgot. I decided quite clearly and quite adamantly to get even with God. I actually believed that I was chosen by God because I was evil and bad. And so if that's what he saw me as, that's what I would become. At the age of 15, I moved out, I left home. I was using needles and living wherever with boyfriends in the streets. I was extremely at risk. As the women wrestled with the effects of Sylvester's abuse, he spent another decade at St. Ursula's, sending more girls into their own downward spirals. He did good work there as far as church work is concerned, but it gave him that opportunity. It gave him that place where he had this whole group of children that were just right there for him. Through the following years, court documents show that the church moved Sylvester to different postings in the diocese. Complaints of inappropriate behavior followed him. He'd be sent away somewhere for a little while. And I think that there was this idea that he would come back a whole person, that he would come back as someone who would be able to function in a parish and be able to, to do the work that he had been chosen to do and that this wouldn't be a problem anymore. The problem was that uh, in every parish, the priest just reoffended and destroyed more lives. Wherever the church sent him, it seemed to be business as usual for Charles Sylvester. But for Irene, it would never be business as usual again. 
My daughter was making her first communion. I brought my daughter to go see the priest, and he said to me, I need to speak with your daughter alone. And I said, no. And that was the first time I ever said no to a priest. I just remember being very scared and scared for my daughter. And so saying no seemed the most unnatural thing to do, but at the same time seemed the most natural thing to do. There's a number of survivors I've met who haven't thought about what happened to them until they have a daughter the same age that they were when they were abused. Though they may try to wonder why they're so anxious and overprotective. And in fact, the past memories uh, start to come back. I just remember sitting in my living room and just all these memories just came flooding over me all at once and and I just started crying and I kept repeating, no, this can't be true, what's going on? And I didn't know what was happening to me. After weeks of despair, Irene turned to a priest who was the chair of the church's sexual abuse committee. So I went to see him at his parish. He walked me into the rectory he closed the door, he sat down, he had his collar on. Just like that, I was 10 years old again. And I couldn't stop crying. I couldn't stop crying and he was asking me, you know, what, who did this to you? And I couldn't say his name. And he said, in what city did this happen? And I said, Chatham. And he said, was it Father Sylvester? And I think at the time, I, I felt like I was the only one, but at the same time, if he knew, I couldn't have been the only one. The diocese agreed to pay for counseling, but they soon started sending letters to her therapist, questioning the cost of her treatment. I felt like I was being badgered by the hierarchy of the church because they were sending letters saying, why does she need to be in therapy for so long? Why does she need to go so, so often? How much longer is this gonna continue? I didn't, I didn't feel supported at all in any way and I just thought, it's time for me to take control of my life. It's time for me to get what I need. And so that's when I called a lawyer. Irene's lawyer started a civil suit against the institution that Irene felt had abandoned her. And there was more painful betrayal ahead. Some people that I told early on are no longer in my life. It makes me feel like they chose the Catholic Church over me. The harm done is devastating, and it'll never go away. With friends turning away, Irene had to look somewhere else for support. I took out an ad in various newspapers, and the ad read, Do you remember Father Sylvester? Confidentiality guaranteed. That local ad would find its way across the country, where Joanne Morrison had gone to escape her past. I needed to be far, far, far away from everything that was familiar to me in order to build a, a new life. So I came to the West Coast. But healing would take more than distance and scenery. Joanne found that out the hard way, attending a sexual abuse seminar with other local parents. I sat frozen in pain in the back of this room full of mothers and parents, good parents wanting to learn, with tears just streaming down my face. And that was the catalyst for me, which led me to tell my mother. I said, you know, Charles Sylvester sexually abused me for years when I was a girl, when we would go every Sunday. My mom was shocked. She was just, and I think for her, it must have been an aha. That explains it. That explains why I lost you, my only daughter. Not long after all of this happened, my mother sent me a very small clipping 
which she had cut out at the back of the Chatham Daily News, and it said, Do you remember Father Charles Sylvester? So I wrote a letter. This was written January 29th, 1994. To whom it concerns. I'm not sure why you placed the ad in the paper, do you remember Father Charles Sylvester? But yes, I do remember him. For me, it is very difficult to forget him. I wish I could. Knowing that I wasn't alone and knowing that I wasn't the only one was somehow a comfort for me. She said, I would like to launch a civil suit against the church. I'm in. I told her, I'm in. Count me in. The civil suit process took seven years. There were a lot of delays, and it just seemed to drag on forever. It was just so emotionally and financially draining at the time, and I just wanted to get it done with. And so it was at that point that my lawyer suggested mediation. Her money and energy drained. Irene was willing to accept the payout from the church. But the church wanted that money to buy Irene's silence. So finally, at the end of the day, we reached a settlement, uh, and we agreed on the amount of money and there was a confidentiality agreement. The gag order basically just pissed me off because I don't like to be gagged by anyone. At the time, it felt like it was the right thing to do and I felt like I was gonna get closure and good, this is done with and it's time for me to move on. But I didn't get closure because by signing that gag order, legally, I was required to keep a secret that wasn't mine to keep. After recovering her painful memories of abuse by Father Charles Sylvester, Irene Duchesne had fought for compensation from the church. But she'd agreed to a gag order, and the priest was still free. Irene wanted criminal charges. I went to the Chatham Police and I filed a report. I wasn't aware of the legal process at all. Worried that the church would sue over the gag order, Irene backed down. I really regret signing the gag order and I found that I didn't get closure. And I, I was thinking, here I am keeping someone else's secret and it didn't feel good. If she wanted Sylvester to answer for his crimes, Irene would have to start fighting once again. You know, Irene worked and pushed as far as hard as she could until she figured out a way that she could get that gag order lifted. I wrote Bishop Fabro a letter and I asked him to be released from my gag order. And he did release me. And so the next day I, I had a press conference. Chatham Detective Constable Kate MacArthur had met with Irene on her first visit to the police station. When I read in the papers that the gag order was lifted, I recontacted Irene and asked her if she wanted to come forward at that time. That opened the floodgate because she found out she wasn't alone and Joanne found out she wasn't alone. And the women sitting out there who knew that Charles Sylvester had, had, had molested them, they found out that they weren't alone. So there was a real strength in numbers here. It definitely started the police investigation rolling. She was the, the forefront of the whole investigation. With Irene and Joanne on board, the police had enough to move in on Father Fever. Myself and two other officers came with me to his home in Bell River to, to arrest him for the first time. He was shocked to see us there. He made a comment that this was already dealt with, with Irene. I, I, I deny having uh, touching these people and, uh, and their um, genitals. Uh, I didn't do that. He didn't show remorse whatsoever. He d did admit that he may have touched a half a dozen or so women's breasts. A few, a few times there, I touched their breasts. And, uh, but nothing uh, inside their clothing or anything like that. He would blame the girls that, you know, their skirts would, you know, go up or they'd come and sit on his lap and give him a hug, put blame on the, the young girls that they wanted 
what had happened. Sylvester was allowed to go home, but the case against him grew bigger every day. After his arrest, there was many victims started to call in in regards so that they were abused by Father Sylvester. In London, one of those women called police detective Paul Martin. Detective Paul Martin. I was in the office on a weekend, and I received a telephone call from a woman who had um, disclosed to me that she had heard about an investigation involving Charles Sylvester. As a result of that interview that I did with that woman, I was provided with a, you know, a certain number of names, but albeit, I mean, these are grade school names. So it was very little to go on on trying to identify who they were. The woman had been a student at Mount St. Joseph's. One of the names she gave him was Carolyn. The only information that I had was her, her maiden name and that she lived in a certain part of town. It was a question of just searching through the phone book. I'm a, currently investigating a, uh, an incident that's stemming out of Chatham. He said, I might not have the right person, but did you go to Mount St. Joseph's Academy? And I said, yes. And uh, he said, do you know why I'm calling? I had not seen TV reports or newspapers or anything, but for some reason it came out my mouth and I said, Sylvester, Father Sylvester? And he said, yes. And I just sobbed my guts out. So I told him. I told him everything that went on, everything that I remembered. He exposed himself. And he made me touch him. And I didn't know what, I didn't know anything. I, I didn't know that, like he's a priest, it, it's, it's not, uh, not supposed to be a sin. You have to be very careful when you're interviewing a victim because essentially every time she tells her story, every time she describes you know, what she felt and what she saw and, you know, imagines uh, back to when it happened, she's being re-victimized every time. Paul Martin, when he came across immediately as a caring person, like he cared about me, period. Not just me as a victim, but me, period. And I think that's why I was able to, to open up to him. People have this whole image of police where you're not supposed to let victims in, you're not supposed to get attached to these investigations, you know, you have to remain cold or you're gonna get burned out. Well, you can't. I mean, you, there's an element to you, Yes, you know when to, you have to shut it off, and but there's an element to you that uh, is going to affect you. Memories kept coming, and with each one, Carolyn returned to Paul's office. Paul had to have it down on in black and white, uh, so there was no way this man could get away with anything that he had done. The case was snowballing, and the police brought Sylvester in again. At that time, we had 27 victims and 37 counts of sexual abuse. You want me to start crying and say, I did it, I did it? The interview lasted about two hours again, and really the same attitude from him, that he was, wasn't remorseful. I've never heard such falsehoods, okay. elaborate falsehoods. They've been coached at Didn't admit to anything further than just a few touches of breasts over top of clothes. He wouldn't admit to anything else. The noose was tightening, and Carolyn would soon face her tormentor once again, across the floor of a courtroom. Get out of my way. You too. Disgraced priest Charles Sylvester had finally been charged for his decades of abusing young girls. With police finding new victims and adding charges every day, prosecutor Paul Bailey stepped into the fray. Well, when the police first came to me, they had uh, identified several victims, 
but we knew from the very beginning that this was a case which would likely grow, that uh, likely um, uh, there were many more victims who, who would come forward. Dr. Jaffe's team met with almost every woman who had come forward. By now, there were 47. Most of our tests can't really capture the depth of despair, the depth of hopelessness that many uh, uh, survivors feel. We can measure degree of depression, degree of anxiety, but it doesn't really uh, give you a sense of the, uh, the depth of how many of these individuals were affected uh, for their whole lives and continue to be affected every day. For Carolyn, talking to the psychologists was like being abused all over again. It was digging into emotions that, that I had not been in touch with. Some of my emotions I had never been in touch with, uh, dealing with, with uh, Sylvester. It was taking me from my adulthood um, through my psychiatric treatment, through times where I hated my guts, hated my own guts. Sylvester was far from a repentant soul. He blamed the victims. He blamed these little girls. He told me these little girls planned it. He said he could hear them talking on the balcony as if they would plan the destruction of their own lives. I've never heard such falsehoods. How can you elaborate falsehoods? They've been coached, definitely. Bailey wanted Sylvester to answer for his crimes, but time was running out. Father Sylvester at that time had a, a plethora of ailments as you might expect of a man who's 83 years old but I was very concerned because he had early onset of dementia and if he became demented we would be unable to try him he can hide his face you know like this is a man that was supposed to have lost his faculties but he's got his faculties together enough to hide his face there were 61 charges on the table now 47 for sexual assault, and 14 for rape. After consulting all the victims, Bailey made a difficult decision. The only way that could see Sylvester answer for any of his crimes, Bailey would drop the rape charges to get a guilty plea on the assaults. If I had gone to trial, it would have taken a minimum of two years to get to the end of that process. And there would not have been any convictions at all, but I set certain minimum uh, parameters. The first is that there would have to be a plea for each and every victim. In other words, I wasn't going to trade off some victims to get a conviction on other victims. Sylvester's sentence, three years in the federal pen. Sylvester uh, was old. If he'd been younger, they would have gone ahead and put him on trial. I really didn't feel like three years was su sufficient for the damage that he had done. But at the same time, I thought, you know, he is being brought to justice. That's, you know, at some level, um, people will hear about it, people will know, and maybe now, maybe now I'll get closure. And I know some people were upset about that. For me, it was just having it in the open and having it come to an, a conclusion. Even with his plea bargain, Sylvester would have his day in court. Now it was his turn to confess. It was packed. The courtroom was really packed, full of women and their family. I thought that that was going to be closure, to see him walk down the aisle uh, handcuffed. <laughs> That's why I wanted to be there. True to his word, Paul Martin was right by her side. You know, we sat together in the courtroom, right up front, and uh, it was emotional. It was emotional for me. I can't imagine what it would be for them. I read my victim impact statement. I could go on and on about hardship that I continued to endure, but I'm really tired and drained. And I'm not going to allow this man one more ounce of my energy. And he looked at me and I thought, I've got your attention and it's time. You're not having control over me anymore. You're not have, you're paying attention to me now, not, not me paying attention to you. 
every woman in the room was waiting for one thing. And now, it was time. There he stood at the table with his lawyer, and the clerk stood up and had to read each charge to him. As the charges were being read, Father Sylvester, in a low voice, would say over and over, guilty, guilty, guilty. And you could feel it around the room with each victim. Even if you didn't know them by name, you knew who they were by their demeanor, the way they were physically. And so the judge said, Charles Henry Sylvester, between September 1st, 1970 and December 31st, 1973 inclusive, did indecently assault Irene Joanne DeShane. How do you plead? Guilty. That's what I was waiting for. That's what I, that's what I was waiting for. Father Charles Sylvester had been sentenced to three years in prison for his four decades of abusing young girls. He was off to do his penance, but on the way out of the courtroom, he had to get past Carolyn on her scooter. As he was going by, I had my hands on the handlebar and I went boom, boom, boom. And because, I mean, that was my way of saying I'd love to run you over. I'd love to run. I mean, it's not a vehicle that's going to kill or anything, but that was just my way of showing that you're nothing, you know? Sylvester narrowly escaped Carolyn's vengeance, and the prosecutor wondered if his plea bargain really delivered any justice at all. I was pacing in my office, second-guessing myself, thinking, did I, did I come in too light? You know, is he going to live another 10 years after he gets out of prison? Have I made the wrong choice? And I second-guessed myself up until the morning of the day that he died. Just three months into his sentence, Charles Sylvester died behind the walls of the penitentiary. He, he should have been allowed to stay along, around a lot longer. I don't think he left this earth knowing what he did. I really don't. I have no Catholic faith today. None. None. Irene takes the devotion she once gave to the church and channels it into a group called SNAP, Survivor's Network of Those Abused by Priests. Well, as far as I know, that's my earliest memory. Yeah. It was when I was 10. It was really important for me to carry that kind of work on. And so I, I am a contact person for SNAP in Canada, and I receive a lot of emails and a lot of telephone calls from other survivors. Irene is my hero. I take my hat off to her. I genuflect to Irene. I wouldn't encourage them to go to no, the church. Don't. Tell your parents, tell no. a teacher, tell a trusted adult. Do it's empowering to be able to share our stories, to be able to talk about what happened to us without any shame or guilt. And I think that's just another step on the healing journey for a lot of us. Like all the women, Carolyn has left the Catholic Church behind her. A quiet spot in the woods is her only spiritual place now. It allows me to to have the thoughts that I want to have, and, and that's the only thing that keeps my sanity. That's my spirituality. That's my, my hold on life. Joanne's faith has been torn down, but she's devoted her energy to building something new, her own successful business. And I really like where I am today. Everyone has a story. And what Sylvester did was dirty and bad and, and evil and horrible. But that's not my story. My story is how my life blossomed despite of it. It's easy to feel that this is really hopeless, but the hope is there. The hope is there because people are starting to talk about it. People are starting to, that's the only way that, that this can be resolved, if you will, is if we expose the truth. And if people continue to talk and if we increase awareness and if people can reach out and support other people, that's when the true healing takes place. And if I can be a conduit to that, so be it. So be it. And there are many women who need that kind of help. 
new victims of Sylvester's crimes continue to come forward, joining an ongoing civil suit against the diocese. They hope that ending the silence and the secrets will finally make them free.